Don't believe tourists. We ask the locals. Last summer, I cycled from the very southwest, which is Land's End, to the very northwest of the UK, John O'Groats. It's about a thousand miles. And I did get to see kind of how the landscape changed over time. Yeah, so the first city I lived in for the first 18 years was Manchester, which of course people know because of football. And I would say the second main thing is music. It's where Oasis, Manchester City, Manchester United, and a load of other bands are from. So some people would say go to a Premier League game. And I think that's quite difficult to organize. The tickets are over 50 pounds, many games sell out. I would say if you want to see a football game, just look for a local park on a Sunday or Saturday morning and almost guaranteed there will be some football team playing there and you will experience kind of the what we call Sunday league football which is like overweight old men like <laughs> kicking each other and yeah I think it would be a very authentic experience. Go to museums. In the UK most museums are free for visitors, i.e. completely free you can just turn up and walk in which I actually think is an amazing thing. So. It's actually quite difficult to see what the effects are so far because it's just not been that long. Of course, at the moment, inflation in the UK is much higher than the rest of Europe, and it's potentially related to Brexit. Hi, Dan. Hello. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here today in my podcast. Yeah, back for a few days in Austria. Exactly, back in Austria for a few days and happy that we managed to see each other. Yeah. So, Daniel, we are today here to speak about the UK, the United Kingdom. And so tell our listeners at first a few sentences about yourself. Oh, about myself. So I am a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Um, yeah, I used to live in Austria. That's how we knew each other, where I also had a role at the university. And yeah, I grew up in Manchester, also lived in Bristol, Oxford, so yeah, and now live in Edinburgh, so I've seen a few different parts of the UK. Yeah, very interesting. So you're the perfect guy for our podcast. Exactly, the perfect <laughs> guest. So, well, we already prepared something that we have a good guideline for yeah, exactly. our podcast. So, well, first of all, give our listeners a general overview about the UK. Yeah, okay. So the most important thing, what we talk about all the time, is the weather. The thing I guess people should know about the weather in the UK is it's very mild and rainy. And that's because the Gulf Stream is this weather system where there's like a bunch of moisture pushed up from don't know where, but it lands on our island and it means that year round, like we barely ever get snow and then also in the summer is also pretty mild, but it does mean there's a lot of rain and there's also more on the west than the east coast. Yeah, what else about the UK? I think there's about 70 million people maybe, less than Germany, I know that much. Yeah, what else? Well, already the first question made our professor thinking, that's pretty good, I'm happy yeah, yeah. to see that. <laughs> Well, that's already a good overview. Everyone knows that the capital is London. True. So, UK is quite famous, so we can stick with yeah, this okay. general information because mm -hmm. many people know already mm -hmm. a lot about, a, a, a small overview that most people know about UK, yeah, I would exactly. say. Exactly. So, well, you already said a bit that where you ever lived. So you lived in many different cities, right? You saw a lot of the UK. So tell us some highlights of and the cities where you lived and the highlights there. Yeah, so the first city I lived in for the first 18 years was Manchester, which of course people know because of football. And I would say the second main thing is music. It's where Oasis, Manchester City, Manchester United, and a load of other bands are from. The second city was Bristol. That's where I went and did my first degree. Bristol's in the southwest. I'm close to Devon and Cornwall, which are beautiful parts of the UK. Bristol's also known for music, I guess. I'm um, Trip Hop, came from there, and it's quite an alternative city. Then the third city was Oxford, which is, of course, a university town. So there's lots of old buildings, claims to be, I think, the oldest university in the world, but it's at least the oldest in the UK. Also fame. Oxford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very famous. So, Lots so of, listeners, like, old we buildings. have a very smart guy here today. Wow, I don't know about that. Um, and don't wonder about his stretching. He's cycling often, so he needs <laughs> to stretch all the time. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and then the fourth is Edinburgh, where I live at the moment, which is the capital of Scotland. It's a beautiful city. Um, on the seaside? Yeah, People on the sea. People probably doesn't know. Yeah, true. It is by the sea. It's, there's hills. It's quite close to the highlands. Um, yeah. Yeah, and very beautiful too. Even in summer, it's possible to swim in the seaside, see sunset on the hills up there. So pretty cool. Even, it's, even in the winter, you can if you're tough enough. If you're tough Which enough. I am not. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> some people are, but not us yeah. too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. So you already saw a lot of the UK. So, well, you also lived here in Austria. So that's a good point. I often make in my podcast a comparison between Austrians, Central Europeans and the yeah, yeah. origin of my interview partner. So mm -hmm. your origin is UK. So can you make a small comparison between Austrians yeah. and English Between people. the two. Yeah. So I would say the first place I came to in Austria was Innsbruck. Um, and I lived here, yeah, for three years. And for the first time until I was with you, actually, I thought all of Austria was beautiful because the only places we kind of went were like ski towns or like towns in the <laughs> mountains where everything was beautiful. And then we did this cycle ride where we arrived in Linz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was like, okay, this seems more similar to, yeah, what I know of the UK. Um, so that's maybe in terms of the cities. Yeah, we of course have smaller mountains than Austria. In terms of the people, yeah, hard to make a comparison. Um, in terms of food, I would say the quality of ingredients here are a lot higher. So I would buy like the basic cheese in, for instance, Empreis or Spa. And I think it tasted as good as like a fancy cheese in the UK. So that's I'm happy a big to difference. hear that because last time I had a friend from Pakistan here and he said the opposite. He said ingredients in Pakistan are much better. So, ah, okay. Yeah. No, I would say the Austrian ingredients are very good. Yeah, the bread as well. Good to hear that. Yeah. Any other dimensions to compare? Well, mostly the people. So I would say they are quite different because the sportive opponent here mm -hmm. in Austria is quite high, especially in the west of Austria. Is it the same in the UK? Yeah, so that probably is a big difference. We are a very obese nation, I think among the most obese in Europe. Um, yeah, I would say also in terms of drinking culture, that was a big difference I noticed here. Okay. People are more likely to put a few beers in their backpack and hike to the top of a mountain mm -hmm. and have yet one or two beers. Whereas in the UK, it's much more common to get laddered, really drink a lot of beer with the purpose of just getting as wasted as possible to go out. Yeah, that's true. I guess everyone who was there made this experience that yeah, people yeah, drink yeah. a lot there. Yeah. But that brings me to another topic, to the costs, because beers are quite expensive, right? And living also, living costs, especially in London, it's quite famed that rents are enormous. Yeah. Yes, I would say in the southeast, especially London, it's very expensive. I would say actually supermarkets are cheaper in the UK than Austria. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I found for basic ingredients. And then in terms of restaurants and dr restaurants, probably similar. And drinks here are cheaper, I would say, yeah. Yeah. And then rents here, I mean, I think A, rents are cheaper here and B, the quality of housing is so much higher. Yeah, the place I'm staying at the moment is just in a sublet of a student accommodation. And yeah, I would love to live in it, even though now I have a yeah, full-time job. Um, yeah, and a quite a good one, right? You're yeah, yeah, exactly. So. But the quality of housing is so low in the UK. We really don't build houses properly to be insulated, to last. Yeah, that's actually a big difference. Like in the preparation, we spoke about your last year and you told me that in winter time you didn't have a normal heating system you have just uh... yeah true yeah so this was quite this is quite a special part about where i'm living at the moment so i live in a former tenement apartment which is like these big shared apartment blocks where the workers used to live and this one was obviously made before there was central heating so i just have electric radiator heaters mm -hmm. And normally it's okay, but in December it was really cold in the UK, like below five degrees the whole time. And it was freezing. We had to move all of our stuff into one room. And yeah, we were under duvets the whole time working. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
big but, respect that you <laughs> survived that. <laughs> I think the problem though is what I said before about the mild weather. Here it gets sometimes to like minus 10, minus 20 overnight, and you just wouldn't survive without proper insulation. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, it's only that cold a couple of days a year, yeah, and yeah. people just suffer. Yeah. 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 I made this experience in Sevilla. Like Sevilla is yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 300 days in the year, extremely hot, yeah. and a few days cold, and then you freeze a lot. But then, yeah. yeah I've cold. also heard the same about Portugal. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, then, after we had already the comparison between Austria and England or UK, well, there's obviously the next question lying on the table. It's Brexit. So, how is the situation with Brexit nowadays? Yeah, so the most obvious way it impacts me is now I have to queue up outside the European Union line, which, yeah, is quite emotional, actually. It's quite mm -hmm. sad. And, yeah, we so there's, there's something that's quite... I guess, if you're not paying attention, wasn't obvious. So we voted to leave in, I think, June 2016. Um, and then there was Damn, all these... Already such a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. There was all these negotiations. But we didn't actually leave leave until, I think, the start of January, either 21 or 22. So it was actually mm -hmm. like a long time after. True. So it's actually quite difficult to see what the effects are so far because it's just not been that long. Of course, at the moment, inflation in the UK is much higher than the rest of Europe, and it's potentially related to Brexit. But how so, high is it then? Because here it's already over 10%. Yeah, so I think it's fallen recently. So yours has fallen to like, I don't know, below 6 or yeah. below 5. Nowadays, true, yeah. Ours was rising and up. I think it's still at like 8%. Okay, so it's there's still quite a divergence mm -hmm. between them. Yeah. So life costs are quite high at the moment. Yeah, 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 it's going up. And I think. I mean, another big impact, and this might be interesting for your listeners, is that the pound is a lot weaker, which of course is bad for us because it means when we go mm -hmm. abroad, things seem more expensive. But the reverse is also true. For, your, for people from mainland Europe going to the UK, it will be cheaper than it was before Brexit. Mm -hmm. That's a positive thing for people outside of the UK. Yeah, exactly. But how is it now for you guys to travel? Do you need a visa to go? Right. To Right now, to the European, like the former EU member states, we don't. I believe I read some news about in Spain in the future, we have to apply for, you know, similar to applying to the US from an EU mm. member state, where you apply online and it's, you don't have to go to the embassy, but it will still be a couple of pounds. But I don't, I don't know the exact details with that at the moment. So anyway, traveling will be much harder than before. Well, I would say traveling, I don't anticipate being much harder. I think both sides, like the UK and also the European member states, want there to be tourists moving. So I don't think there would be big barriers there. It's of course harder to do what I did, which is move to Austria and yeah, start a new life. Yeah, working outside of the UK will be harder yeah, than yeah. before, for sure. Yeah. 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 What else about Brexit? Is it still, do people still speak about it? So I think the two main political parties, Labour and Conservatives, have not agreed, it's not a conspiracy, but both have decided that it's better not to talk about the negative sides of it because there was this perception that we spoke about it for so long and people just want to move beyond it. But I think now we have left and there's all these negative economic consequences, I think at some point a political party or politician will start to be honest about the consequences of Brexit. And I think we will start to speak about that again. For sure, yeah. 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 Interesting, interesting. Let's see how it will be in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll I oft, often ask my guests about five things to do. Yeah. So do you have five things to do in your mind what people sh definitely should do if they're in the UK? Yeah, okay. So uh, number one, I think, is go to museums. In the UK, most museums are free for visitors, i.e. completely free, you can just turn up and walk in, which I actually think is an amazing thing. Because even when you go to countries like Germany or some of the Scandinavian countries, they seem more progressive and socialist, but they make people pay to go mm -hmm. to museums. So I think that is a cool thing. There's some amazing museums, especially in London. Um, Do you have one example? I love Tate Modern Museum. It's an amazing building on the south bank of the Thames. Really, all of the amazing modern um, 
modern art artists. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I've been there too. I really yeah. liked it too. And I'm not a museum guy, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's an amazing building. Yeah. Yeah, and then, okay, number two. So I would say with food, the thing to know about the UK, I guess, is even though our food is maybe a bit bland, I also think Austrian food is quite bland, we, of course, had this huge influence from uh, the British Empire. So Indian food, I would say in the UK, is more popular, similar, if not more popular, than British food. So I would say for sure, go to an Indian restaurant and eat Indian food in the UK. Okay. Yeah, it's also because a lot of English people living there, right? Yeah, like a, a fair number of English went over to India and obviously experienced mm. food that tasted of something. And then also, yeah, many South Asians, so also Pakistanis, Bangladeshis moved to the UK. So lucky you got some good food, finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Okay, and then number three. Okay, so. Last summer, I cycled from the very southwest, which is Land's End, to the very northwest of the UK, John O'Groats, it's about a thousand miles. And I did get to see kind of how the landscape changed over time. I would say, if you want nature, go to the north of England. Either the Scottish Highlands are beautiful, I think that's where- Totally the, confirm that, yeah. Yeah, where the biggest mountain in the UK is, one of the only mountains that's over 1,000 meters. But also the north of England, like the Lake District. It's the highest Yorkshire. Ben Nevis. I think so, yeah. Yeah, OK. You went up it? Yeah, I went up there, yeah. Yeah, OK, well, there you yeah. go. Conquered the highest mountain in our country before. Because you want to do the highest in Tyrol or Austria? Uh, in Tyrol. Tyrol, yeah. yeah. I did Twilspitz, that's the highest in Tyrol. Yeah. But I still missed the Großglockner, which is the highest yeah, in exactly. Austria. So you did highest in the UK first. Yeah, true. So sport, of course, even though we're an obese nation, is a big thing in the UK. So football is. Well, I would say there's kind of two national sports depending on the class. If you're not posh, it's football. And if you're posh, it's more likely to be rugby. Um, but I would say, so some people would say go to a Premier League game. And I think that's quite difficult to organize. The tickets are over 50 pounds, many games sell out. I would say if you want to see, so some people would say go to a Premier League game. And I think that's quite difficult to organize. The tickets are over 50 pounds, many games sell out. I would say if you want to see a football game, just look for a local park on a Sunday or Saturday morning and almost guaranteed there will be some football team playing there and you will experience kind of the what we call Sunday league football, which is like overweight old men like <laughs> kicking each other. And yeah, I think it would be a very authentic experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they will love it, of course, to have these like foreign people yeah. watching them. Makes a difference to their like... Yeah. And they're in some kind of parks. Just go to a park. Just any park, there will be some kind of Sunday league football going on. So it might be children playing that's yeah. maybe interesting, but I think actually the kind of old men playing is more interesting. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. next time I will definitely do that yeah, yeah. for sure. And then the final one, I would try to find some kind of history. So like most cities, no matter where you go, will have some kind of history museum. Or you can do a walking tour, because I think, yeah, we are kind of a, a long-standing nation. And yeah, we have a role in kind of global history that's worth understanding about. So for instance, one, I guess, important museum would be the Slave Museum in Liverpool, mm -hmm. about our role in the slave trade. Yeah. I also checked that out. That was yeah. also very interesting. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big history, as you said. Yeah. yeah. So then, if people are traveling to the UK, what are the, the most beautiful cities? Like the cities which people definitely have to see. Yeah, okay. So I used to, when I lived in um, Oxford, of course, it's a very international place. Loads of people come from around the world to study there. And it always made me laugh to kind of ask people where they've been in the UK. And there was about five cities that came up over and over again. So of course, London, Cambridge, York, Edinburgh. Um, these are kind of the like traditionally beautiful cities with like yeah, a range of buildings kind of, yeah. Um, so they, they are the obvious choices if you want kind of beautiful architecture. I would say in terms of nature, um, the two big national parks, well, there's the Highlands, which is actually multiple kind of national parks. Um, in Scotland, which is to the north, um, more difficult to get to, I guess, depending where you fly into. 
And then also the Lake District, which is just north of Manchester, about two hours or so north of Manchester. But both, I would say, you really need a car to get around, or maybe cycling. They're not so easy with public transport. I see. Well, that's a short yeah. and simple overview. Very yeah. good, thanks. <laughs> well, listeners, we are now on a new spot here. We are still in a botanical garden of Innsbruck, and we choose the botanical garden of Innsbruck today because... It's here, quiet and peaceful. We thought so, but in the end, they cut it, the grass around us, so we had to change, and now we are here again. And you have a new spot, and you can watch new beautiful trees and flowers. Yeah. And most likely, some people walk in the background, so it might be interesting. Exactly. Well, but let's get back to our topic, the UK today, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we spoke about the most beautiful cities, and people from Oxford went to mm -hmm. some a few cities, let's yeah, say handful. five cities, mm -hmm. which they always go. But I'm just interested. How is it to study at Oxford University? Because in my mind, it's just smart people, intellectual people and less free time. And yeah, but let's just give us a small overview about it. Yeah, I think many different kinds of people go. I was expecting it to be more people kind of somehow thirsty for knowledge. But actually, you find a lot of people who are thirsty more for, I guess, um, I don't know, to advance their career or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was, well, I don't know if it's a surprise, but it, it definitely shifted my expectations somewhat. I'd say bachelors is very different to postgraduate, which is what I did when I went. Bachelors, they're there for, I think, eight weeks, and they have to pack everything into these eight weeks, like studying, seeing friends, exams. And you kind of see the bachelor's students and they're in this state of just complete absorption with each other, not self-absorption, in their own little world. And I think for them, it's insane trying to pack so much into just three eight-week terms. Um, for postgraduates, it's more, I guess, drawn out. And of course, there's a difference between the people who arrive for one year to do a master's degree versus people like me, a PhD for four years. And I guess for us, we're the closest to living in Manchester, because sorry, in Oxford, because we're there for four years and we really live there the whole year. Whereas for other people, they're kind of just there for a few months, really, in reality. And it's, I think, quite a transient experience where people come. They try to extract as much experience and memories and like network connections as possible. And that can also make it quite transactional and transient. But let's get back to the eight weeks of bachelor are the bachelor semesters are just eight weeks yeah well that's a really short period right yeah yeah it's tiny i mean of course it's good for the professors because well in your position as a professor yeah. you see that in another way that's true okay yeah. i got your point interesting life in oxford yeah also think what i have to see next to the football games in the in the yeah, parks yeah. Well, thanks for this short overview about mm -hmm. it. Well, and we have another topic which I'm interested in and I guess our listeners to the political situation in the UK. There was a lot of stories about the Corona parties with Johnson yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, all the things before in the, your political situation. And so give us also here some sentences. How is it the situation at the moment? Yeah. Okay. So... I guess we can start with uh, Johnson's government and the pandemic. So of course they, like most European countries, the pandemic strikes. He was quite famous for, um, at first, acting like it was less serious than it was. He kind of made these jokes about meeting um, patients with coronavirus and shaking hands with them. So that was him at first. And then kind of they have this moment where they realize the NHS will be overwhelmed and they're like, shit, this is like a real problem. Then the UK, especially in comparison to Austria, had lockdowns for much longer um, time than Austria. Like we had this kind of short two month lockdown in May 2020. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was quite relaxed. Like we could go skiing because, of course, in Tyrol, ski lifts are an essential <laughs> activity. But... In the UK, it was very well, long. That's public transport, you know. Yeah, true. Okay, <laughs> public transport, yeah. Um, then in the UK, it was much more long and drawn out. And I think this created a kind of 
two approaches to this. Some people observed it, they tried to protect friends and family and stop the spread of the virus. And then of course, when it goes on for so long, some people start to break the regulations. Then what emerged, of course, was that Johnson and some other people in his government were having work parties during the lockdown, and especially during the first stage when it was a very strict lockdown. So this was kind of reported on in the press, and it's a scandal, of course, it's a big, big topic, and it keeps coming up. But the reason he actually resigned was when he was speaking to Parliament about this, he misled Parliament in some way. And while there was an investigation into whether he misled Parliament and to kind of solve the problem, he resigned. Um, and then, of course, he leaves. Recently, there was an inquiry into um, the COVID pandemic, the whole thing. And he actually resigned not as prime minister, but as a member of parliament, because you first get elected as a member of parliament mm -hmm. and then you kind of form a government. He resigned as a member of parliament because the report from this um, investigation was about to be published. So this issue really toppled his government. Then the person who came in after him was Liz Truss, I think. We've had so many prime ministers, it's possible I'm forgetting someone, but I think it was Liz Truss. Well, and, that's so true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was for 30 days, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I think it was Liz Truss. quite a common situation in Austria. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, true. Um, she comes in and she has this very right-wing view, wow, yeah, very right-wing view of how the economy works. She thinks if you cut taxes, it will lead to growth. And she announces this budget and immediately the financial markets panic, interest rates come up and the Conservative Party, whose kind of electoral base is based on owning homes, they are shocked by this and they immediately think, OK, she has to go because, um, oh, what do they call it? The kamikaze budget, because this was such a catastrophe. So then they bring in Rishi Sunak, who, is, who was kind of head of the Treasury, which is like the finance department under um, Johnson and he is kind of brought in to steady the ship. They also bring in some more kind of stable politicians, less of the kind of fringe. And yeah, that's the situation we're in right now. I guess the big change is that after her kamikaze budget, interest rates came up. In the last month or so, they've come up to the same level. So even though they've got rid of the kind of extreme right person, we're in the same economic catastrophe. So that's going to be really interesting to see how it evolves, I guess there will be a lot of suffering for people who took out mortgages. Okay, so also let's see what happens in the future. It's quite the same with Brexit, many open questions yeah. and some troubles for people with mortgages, so for sure. So they have, I think... Quite similar here, I would admit yeah, yeah, to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think they have a year and a half until they have to do another election. And right now the Conservative Party, who've been in power since 2010, although it was shared in 2010, their polling at like the lowest level, their opinion poll rating is really bad. Crazy. Yeah. Well, anyway, enough yeah, yeah. about politics. Yeah. We got that. And in the end, I often ask my listener, uh, my guests about secret spots. Can you give yeah. our listeners a secret spot? Yeah, okay. So, for me, the secret spot, and I think there's many, but I'll go with a specific one. Near where my granddad used to live, he's passed, um, in, oh God, Dorset. I cycled through, so when I was doing this um, cycle ride, I cycled through all these villages. And I think they're somehow very special. It's like time has kind of forgotten them. They have, for instance, famously not all houses, but many have a thatched roof, which is this roof made out of sticks, crisscross. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that area just seems kind of magical. I think the Southwest has also some of the best weather. The light and the atmosphere is very nice. So yeah, there's many towns in Dorset that I think are very interesting. Dorset. Yeah. I've never think, heard about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, so Devon and Cornwall is this part of the UK that goes further south into the yeah. west. This weird bit that sticks out. They're very hilly. There's lots of beaches. It's where if you go surfing in the UK, you would go. Um, but Dorset is kind of the next county along, and it's also similarly kind of sleepy. Another I would like to go to, I've not, well, maybe when I was younger, but not been there since I was an adult, is the, the East Coast, and especially um, areas like, oh, 
I can never remember the names, but around like Norwich, Boston, I think this area is similar to Dorset. It's like time has forgotten it somehow. Obviously not, not really. But there's like these very classic old Sleepy villages. Towns. Yeah, and I would like to just go and see it. That okay. area, it's called the Fens, is very flat. There's no hills whatsoever. Nice, yeah. that's already good. Yeah, Two yeah. secret spots, very good. Yeah. Thanks okay. a lot. <laughs> Don't want to give away all the secrets. <laughs> nah, well, you wouldn't find that on Google if you yeah. Google that. So that's pretty cool and a uh, big help for our listeners. Well, there normally we speak about the language of my guests, but English, well, we already speak English, so we don't need to get some words out of you even if your English is much better than mine, obviously. But mm -hmm. anyway, you told me in advance that guys from Manchester have some words which just exist in Manchester, right? Yeah, true. We do. Can you give us uh, some examples about that? Uh, so I can give you one, which is the only one that's come into my mind right now, which is Skelly. Well, Daniel, thanks a lot for all the input and all the interesting things, what you told us, the f five must to do there mm -hmm. and also the secret spots which you gave us. Thanks a lot for everything and all the best for your future. And please tell our listeners some last words before we end the podcast. So, I don't know. This is just my view of the UK, but there is a lot to see in the UK. There's a lot more than just London. Um, so yeah, you should just go and explore it. And thanks for watching and listening, guys. And please follow us and like this podcast. And if you have some questions for Daniel, just write it in the comments. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, Daniel. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye, guys. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. And if you like the story, please share it and follow us on our YouTube and Instagram channel, Communicate or Communicate with the World. And a special thanks to Europe Direct for supporting this project.